So when we're looking at preventing infection in the infants, our first strategy, as we've discussed, is really to reduce the maternal viral load to suppressed, okay? That is the overall aim, and that is really our, one of our most effective ways of, of reducing HIV infection um, in the infants. But the second strategy is then looking at the infant. And so what can we actually do for the infant to minimize um, the risks of transmission? And so this is obviously where we come into our infant post-exposure prophylaxis. If both of these steps fail, and unfortunately the child becomes HIV infected, we need to identify infected children as quickly as possible, okay? So our early infant diagnosis um, guidelines, our early infant diagnosis um, procedures, and then initiating antiretrovirals as quickly as possible on those HIV infected infants. We need to be giving um, cotrimoxazole, co preventative therapy, and we need to be continuing to promote and protect breastfeeding. And so what we're aiming at is HIV-free survival, but then also normal growth and development in the infant. Okay. So when we're looking at infant prophylaxis at birth, there are three principles that we need to be considering. Okay. The delivery viral load is going to, as we discussed earlier, determine the risk profile of the infant, and it's going to help us to decide what we need to actually do for the infant, okay? If we do not have a delivery viral load available, and so we know that probably the viral loads take about three to six days um, before we will, will get a result, unless we're actually doing points of care, we can use the viral load from the pre uh, if it's been done in the previous 12 weeks of antenatal, okay? But this will mean that some women, especially if they book early on antiretrovirals and they have their first viral load done at, at that point, it will mean that they actually will be more than 12 weeks in many cases before they have their delivery viral load, okay? And so we'll discuss what that means as we, as we go through these different principles. So the second principle is that we have to err on the side of caution, okay? We have to say that a baby is high risk until we've actually proven that that baby is low risk, okay? And so, again, in some cases, that's going to mean that we may over-treat rather than under-treat initially, but we can change, okay? We can move from high risk to low risk and low risk to high risk, okay? And our delivery viral load is going to help us to determine that, okay? And then the third principle is that we, in terms of trying to protect the infant, we need to carry on with infant prophylaxis until the mother's viral load is suppressed, okay? So in, we'll discuss the, the high-risk and low-risk regimens, but we should only be stopping the infant um, nevirapine at 12 weeks if the mother's viral load is less than 1,000, okay? If it's above 1,000, we need to continue with our infant prophylaxis, okay? So our definitions, our low risk um, is where we have got a viral load less than 1,000, so either at the delivery visit or a viral load available in the last 12 weeks that is less than 1,000, okay? Our high risk scenario is the viral load is over 1,000 or we don't have a viral load available, and that, again, will be either your delivery viral load or a viral load in the last 12 weeks of antenatal, okay? If we don't have that, we, we do need to categorize that infant as being high risk, and we'll move on to the high risk protocol, okay? All right. <clears throat> in our low risk infants, we do, as, we, as we're doing at the moment, six weeks of daily nevirapine for those infants, regardless of our feeding choice, okay? In the high-risk infants, we are going to be giving six weeks of AZT. At the same time, we'll be giving nevirapine for those six weeks, and then we'll continue the nevirapine for at least 12 weeks, okay? If the mother's viral load is still elevated, at, that, at the 12 week point, we need to continue with our daily nevirapine for those infants, okay? Um, so, 
as, I've, as we've discussed, the length really depends on whether the mother resuppresses or not, okay? This is really to, to try and protect the baby as far as possible when obviously the mother is not managing with the antiretroviral, she may have resistance, there may be a whole lot of other issues going on, okay? If the mother, regardless of, of the viral load, if she is not um, breastfeeding, then we will just continue the uh, daily nevirapine for six weeks and then discontinue. Okay. Is, that, is that clear to everybody? Okay, because it's, it's similar to, to what we've had before, but certainly the extended um, nevirapine is, is a change. Okay. All right, so to summarize, but, uh, viral load at deliveries, um, less than 1,000 copies, low risk, we just give daily nevirapine, High risk, mother's got an elevated viral load or we don't have a recent viral load in the last 12 weeks. We give AZT twice daily for six weeks, nevirapine for at least 12 weeks until the woman is suppressed, okay? Um, <clears throat> in an exclusively formula-fed infant, we would still use the high risk protocol. Sorry, I think I was incorrect with my previous statement. We still use the high risk protocol, but just for six weeks, okay? Once the six weeks have, have ended. If the baby is not breastfeeding, we discontinue the AZT and we discontinue the Navarapine. Okay? All right. Okay, and then when we look at breastfeeding in the context of HIV, and I think particularly at the beginning of, of the epidemic, this was a huge kind of raging debate, but I think certainly now we are all very comfortable with the fact that actually the benefits of, of breastfeeding an HIV-exposed um, infant far outweigh the risks associated with um, breastfeeding, but we need to reduce those risks as far as possible by firstly keeping HIV-uninfected women negative, but then also by keeping HIV-positive women um, virally suppressed, and we've discussed all the different ways that we will be doing that. All right, and so when we unpack this a little further, you can see that there are a whole lot of risk reduction um, strategies that we can use in HIV negative women to try and ensure that they remain HIV negative. We need to be doing our regular testing and we need to be um, giving feeding advice and support. And then in women with, um, living with um, HIV, we need to make sure that they are on antiretrovirals, that they are suppressed, that we are managing our infant prophylaxis, managing our infant testing, and reducing um, risk reduction in those women still, because we, there still is that the theoretical or potential risk of a reinfection to that woman, but then also a risk that she may in fact transmit HIV to her partner. And then again, ongoing infant feeding advice and support. Okay, so just as a summary, the two strategies that we are going to use to prevent HIV in an infant, in a breastfeeding um, infant, strategy one is maternal viral load suppression. Elevated viral load, it's an emergency. We need to get that viral load down, okay? But strategy two covers us a little bit more, covers the baby a little bit more, giving infant um, prophylaxis, and we're gonna determine whether we high or low risk prophylaxis based on the um, delivery viral load or one of the, uh, or a viral load in the preceding 12 weeks, okay? And this infant prophylaxis obviously just gives us a little bit of time so that we can ensure that that baby's viral load becomes suppressed. So just looking also then at prophylaxis for infants of mothers who have got an elevated viral load during breastfeeding, we know that this can be a, a result of two scenarios, so either a new HIV diagnosis during breastfeeding or that the woman is unsuppressed on her current antiretroviral regimen. In both of these situations, we do need to be concerned about resistance. We know that there's increasing primary um, resistance in South Africa, probably I think up to about 15% at the moment. Um, and then also in the scenario where the woman has an unsuppressed viral load, um, there's about a 40% chance of resistance in the mother. So this is where we then implement our high-risk strategies with continued um, nevirapine. Okay, <clears throat> so the other area of the infant guidelines where there are some changes 
is around <clears throat> early infant diagnosis. Okay, so when do we test? So as we know, we're testing at birth. It's going very well from a programmatic point of view. The tests are being done really well. Okay, so the birth PCR remains. The 10-week PCR remains as is. Okay, and again, that's being well implemented. Remember, we used to do the 18-week PCR in infants who were deemed to be high-risk infants, okay? That now has fallen away, and all HIV-exposed infants will get a six-month PCR done, okay? So what we're hoping with this is that infants who are HIV-infected and we haven't diagnosed them at, at 10 weeks, we're hopefully going to pick them up early now with this additional six-month test, okay? And we also know from many of the studies that have been done that that is actually the highest risk period for breastfeeding infants to be infected is, is actually in that first six months, okay? And this, again, if you remember about the mother's viral load schedule, this PCR is timed to the maternal viral load, which we're also doing at six months. The next change to the guideline is doing universal 18-month HIV testing to, for all children, okay? So we still feel that we're probably missing children when they come for their 18-month visit. Um, we believe that they're children who are falling through the, the cracks and have not been diagnosed. And so the recommendation is to do 18-month, either a rapid or ELISA on all children, whether they are exposed or not. And in HIV-exposed infants, this is aligned with the maternal viral load at 18 months. Okay. We still do the age-appropriate post-cessation of breastfeeding test um, six weeks after breastfeeding has stopped. And then, obviously, if you've got a child who is sick at any stage and you're worried about HIV, any, you, know, you can do the, the HIV test at any time in between. This is also a change in the, in the current guidelines. If we diagnose um, HIV in a, um, a child of any age less than two years, we need to do a confirmatory viral test. Um, and I will summarize this in a following slide. <clears throat> the reason for this is that infants um, who are HIV exposed, um, and particularly where women are on triple therapy as, um, as their own treatment or for prophylaxis. Those infants um, have a, a delayed time to lose their maternal antibodies, okay? So I'm sure everybody remembers that maternal antibodies, maternal HIV antibodies are transferred to the infant. As the infant ages, those antibodies slowly start to break down. But we, and previously we thought, okay, right, by 18 months, we're done, we, we don't have to worry. But there's a concern that if the, the, what we're seeing and, and what some research has shown is that in women on triple therapy, it can actually take longer for those infants to lose those HIV antibodies, even if they are not infected, okay? So the new change in the, in the guidelines is to, especially in this category of, of children here, so the 18 months, oh, this is not <laughs> working, sorry, um, the 18 months, to, to two-year-olds, we can do our first test as a rapid, but if that is positive, we need to confirm with a PCR, okay? And then over two years, we can do both of our, our first and confirmatory tests can be rapid tests, okay? Everybody clear? Right. Okay, and so what we do need to remember too is that HIV exposed but uninfected infants, even if they don't have HIV infection, they are still at risk, okay? We know that they may have poorer birth outcomes and we think that this is probably a combination of, of exposure to antiretrovirals but also to HIV, okay? They may have symptoms of anemia, they may have impaired growth and, and neurodevelopment, they may be hospitalized more frequently than HIV um, unexposed infants. And we also need to remember that in some cases, there, there will be maternal illness or death. I think certainly we know now because we're diagnosing women um, and adults much earlier, we hope that this won't be the, the scenario. But unfortunately, we, we do know that there is still 
maternal morbidity and mortality associated with HIV infection. So we do need to remember that these infants may experience poor outcomes just because of being HIV exposed. So we need to keep our eye on this. And certainly the, the, these guidelines are, are really trying to emphasize, emphasize that we don't only want an HIV uninfected or HIV negative child, but we also want them to be thriving and we want them to be growing and developing normally.